So as we begin our final class based on the teachings of St. Francis de Sales, let us begin with one of his greatest pieces of advice when it comes to keeping God's grace and our peace in a very difficult world. So number one tonight is this, always be attached to the will of God. That's things a lot of people struggle with, is staying with the will of God. You will always stay if you are attached to the will of God. St. Francis de Sales would often recommend to his people who came to him for spiritual direction, do their best to keep one's heart exalted. So very often our hearts become discouraged or heavy or burdened, right? Keep them exalted, keep them very high, and attach it firmly and confident to the will of our merciful God. And again, he stresses that obedience is so critically important for our souls, as long as we have to remain in this world, which of course we have no choice, right? God's will will constantly remind us of how much He loves us, and thus we can perform, as we have to, for love of God and neighbor, willfully and cheerfully. It won't be a burden, it won't be, won't be drudgery. But St. Francis de Sales brings up a good point when he talks about how many Christians, they do detach themselves from the world, many do a good job with that, but they still struggle to stay attached to the will of God. So he says this, Many leave the world who, for all that, do not leave themselves, but seek instead their own taste, their ease, their contentment. And these per persons are marvelously eager for this, for the self-love which urges them on is a turbulent, impetuous, unruly love. We should not, not ever be of this type of sort. As Francis exhorts us, we need to be able to, yes, leave the world, the attractions, the allurements of the world, so to speak, in order to serve, not ourselves, but God, to follow God, to love God in that type of attitude. And if we can have that attitude, we can remain firmly planted in God's will with a good heart. And since we'll be only concerned with holy service, with being the best Christians that we can be, no matter where we might be at, we shall be content. So being obedient to God's will is very comforting if you just simply stick with it, okay? But of course our Lord provides for us in order for us to remain attached to the will of God. He helps us to stay attached to Him. So St. Francis once said this, Abide in peace. Do that well on account of which you remain in the world, but do it with a good heart and be assured that God will bless you. Our Lord always provides us with the gifts of peace. I talk about this all the time. He always gives us our peace if we simply allow Him. And especially if you're following Him, it's in that peace that we'll keep focused on where we are going. You know that. We don't have any peace. Sometimes we don't know what our next step is even going to be, right? Have a sense of peace. You always know where you're going because you're going with our Lord. Now, the world, as we know it, of course, especially our hectic, godless, modern times, is very good at taking away our peace and thus affecting our ability to stay attached to God's will. So St. Francis de Sales tells us this. The world will talk. And what will people say? Well, all this is nothing to those who look not upon time except in the light of eternity. Don't worry about what other people think. Only God is the one who matters. And so in other words, the light that we live our days, our day by days, is always blessed by the light of eternity. Okay, I'll never forget that. We're not here. We're on our way to be over there. And don't worry. But don't worry about what people say, only God's the one who matters. But Francis also tells us in this regard so we can be able to abide in that peace, in the presence of God, and stay, of course, on the right course. If something is not pleasing to God, it should never be pleasing to you. If you can have the right attitude, then as Francis says, you'll be able always to abide with our Savior, crucified, planted in the middle of your heart. You see, our Lord Jesus comes to us all the time, all different ways. Sometimes he comes to us as the Christ child. Sometimes he comes to us as the 12-year-old in the finding of the temple. You happen to be there with his father's house. But sometimes he comes to us as the crucified one. Keep the crucified one in the middle of your heart. It'll help you to attach to God's will, to be obedient, abide in his peace. All those things that help keep us close to the great merits and power of our Lord's crucifixion. Of course, the grace is, of course, for eternal life. And to keep our focus on our Lord Jesus in this regard, Francis gives us this example. He says this, he wrote this down. I saw a while ago a girl who was carrying a pail of water. 
in the middle of which she had placed a piece of wood. I wished to know why she did this, and she told me it was to stop the motion of the water, for fear it might spill over. As long as the wood was in the middle of the pail, it would not spill out. So henceforth I said, we must place the cross, the wood of the cross in the middle of our hearts to stop the unbalanced movements of our affections and by the wood of the cross to balance us out so that we may not spill out because of disquiet or troubles of spirit. Beautiful piece of advice. Keep the center of your heart, the crucified Lord, and always keep your bearings upon that. You'll never be out of balance. The next piece of advice to keep us calm in this world of ours is very closely related to the first one, and that is this. Number two is, cast yourself on God. Cast yourself on God. So St. Francis de Sales once said, You ask me whether a soul, having the consciousness of her misery, can go to God with great confidence. Now I reply that not only the soul which has the consciousness of her misery can have great confidence in God, but she cannot have a true confidence unless that soul has the knowledge of this misery. For this knowledge and the admission of this our misery introduces us to God. Interesting quote, let's break this down. For those of us who've been around for a while and have suffered many miseries over the years, you know this is true, don't you? The more our soul has complete knowledge of our misery, sometimes we don't want to go there, we don't want to know, but yeah, we really do. We really want to know what is our suffering, what is our struggles. The more we know that, the closer we can come to God. Now true for the world, this has always been the case, so very often miseries, sufferings, troubles can drive people away from God. But as St. Francis de Sales tells us, these should always introduce us to God day by day, or however often we have them. So St. Francis points out in his teaching is all the great saints, such as the Old Testament ones, Job, David, and many others, they began their prayer with the confession of their misery. Remember our class we had on the Psalms? Some of the Psalms began with saying, you know, Lord, how, how, how big of a mess I'm in, okay? You recognize that you're miserable. You're in struggles, you're in trials, you're in hardships. That's a good thing. Be conscious of that one is poor, unworthy even, to appear before God. We bring this up to offer to our Lord. So that's why St. Francis tells us that proverb so famous among the ancients, know thyself, at the same time it applies to the greatness and excellence of the soul. We should not abuse and or profane it by things that are unworthy. That also applies to the knowledge of our own unworthiness, imperfection, and misery. So the more we feel ourselves to be miserable, the more we should trust in the goodness and mercy of God. So don't, don't misconstrue that. You're not supposed to be a mess all the time, all right? Don't get used to that, all right? But when we are in messes, all right, let it be something that not just introduces us to God, but to God's mercy, all right? So as this great saint teaches us, between God's mercy and our misery, there's a connection, there's a bond, so it's so close that one cannot relate without the other. In fact, look at it this way. This is really brilliant on his part. He said this, if God had not created any of us, he would still be all good. But he would not actually have been merciful. For mercy is only given toward those who are miserable. It's a great insight on his part. Okay, if none of us were here, he wouldn't be a merciful God. But we are here, so he is a merciful God. Okay? So you see, the more we feel ourselves miserable, the more we recognize where we're, we're burdened and so forth, the more opportunities we have to put our trust in God, not the other way around. Don't look at more opportunities to cuss God out, to get mad at Him. No, the more opportunities to come and to trust in Him. Since, let's be honest, where else are you going to find your rest? With Netflix? Huh? Where else are you going to find your rest? Like iPad? Can't, can't keep, keep, keep the thing charged. Okay? God's always with you. Because we really can't put our trust in ourselves, to be honest there, we can't trust the world because, after all, the world gives us half the miseries we have to go through. So we don't stay in the miseries. We use them as a spring to cast ourselves onto our Lord. But he does bring up a good point, though, when he says we can't trust ourselves. Very good point. So he says this. 
Mistrust in ourselves arises from the knowledge of our imperfections. So it's good to mistrust ourselves, but to what advantage would it be for, for us to do so? Were it not to throw our confidence on God and then to wait for his mercy. So in other words, don't, don't stay down. Yeah, sometimes we can't trust ourselves. Some temptations, some imperfections are just kind of, just kind of rough on us. Don't stay down. Let it catapult you in confidence into the Lord's mercy. But it is hard to have this kind of confidence if we feel sometimes disconnected, right? Because sometimes God feels far away. It just happens every now and then. So St. Francis himself, he tells us how to, to deal even with that. If you feel no such confidence, cease not on that account from making acts of faith. And say to our Lord just the same, O Lord, though I have no feeling of confidence in you, I nevertheless know I have no hope but only in your goodness. So I abandon myself wholly into your hands. So in other words, guys, jump anyway. Cast yourself anyway. Just go. You know he's going to catch you, okay? It's always in our power to make acts of faith. It just is. And to once again try and place all of our confidence in God. And though it might be difficult at times, it's not impossible. But when things are difficult, that's when we have to cast ourselves, like I said, into our Lord's hands. So just be able to throw ourselves with everything that we have, everything we have, okay, into his presence. But as Francis teaches us, we do this not just with our lips. Oh yeah, Lord, I'll do that. No, you do it with your heart. You ever realize that? Well, how, how do you leap into, how do you take a leap of faith? It's your heart that jumps. It jumps into the one who loves you. Just that simple. And as Francis teaches us, you do this with your heart. But in other words, you cast yourself, you take that jump, that leap of faith, but you do it calmly peacefully, confidently. You know who's going to catch you, okay? And so as Francis says to wrap up this piece of advice, though we need to feel and to acknowledge our own misery from time to time, don't stop at the misery. Don't stop there, don't get stuck there, nor fall or become discouraged. But keep your hearts up. What do we say at Mass every time we go to Mass? Lift up your hearts. And thus be able to keep our courage and our confidence and though we might be weak and imperfect at times, God will bring us to the place where we're strong and perfect. Because he'll be with us, in us, through and through. Okay, what do we have so far? Always be attached to the will of God. And don't be fearful to cast yourself onto God. Well, number three is also related to those first two. Number three is this, unite perfectly to divine goodness. So St. Francis de Salles, he tells us, it's necessary you should know that to abandon one's soul and to allow oneself, as it were, to drop out of one's own hands into God's means nothing else but parting with our own will to give it to God. Because it would be to little purpose our renouncing and surrendering ourselves if this were not done in order to unite ourselves perfectly to divine goodness. So, that being the case, one of the main reasons we should abandon ourselves into God's will and to surrender ourselves to Him is because this will unite us more strongly to the goodness of God. So the same way that we cannot really be loving unless we have the love of God, we cannot really be patient unless we have His patience, we cannot really be good unless we have His goodness. Now, here's the thing though. We're naturally inclined to greater things. We really are. Our soul longs for the things that will endure, that will last, that are truly noble. Well, goodness is definitely one of those things because goodness is one of the great attributes of God himself. He is goodness itself. So we can actually, if we abandon ourselves to our Lord, bring God himself into this crazy world by bringing in, through us, his actual goodness. You guys, you can bring God's love to others, you can bring his mercy, his peace, you can bring his goodness. So St. Francis de Sales tells us, now in order to achieve this abandonment, one must obey the expressed will of God and that of his good pleasure. What does that mean? What this means is that we must not only be obedient to the will of God, but if we're going to unite perfectly with the goodness of God, we have to also obey God's good pleasure. In other words, we have to obey everything knowing everything God sends our way is for our own good and for the good of all. 
So you can't bring goodness into the world if you're questioning God's goodness with you in the first place. Because sometimes we, sometimes we argue with God, right? Are you sure this is good for me? Are you sure? Man, you're going to trust me or not, okay? Sometimes we just have to just abandon everything to that, to God's will, but also to his good pleasure. He clarifies this point by saying, the expressed will of God includes his commandments, his counsels, his inspirations, the rules and ordinances of our church. But the will of his good pleasure has to do with the issues of things we cannot foresee. For example, I don't know if I'm going to die tomorrow, but I do know that if I am, it is the good pleasure of God that I die. And so I abandon myself to his good pleasure. I'll die then with a good heart. In the same way, I don't know whether in the coming year the, fruit, the fruits of the earth will be ruined by some storm. If it happens that it, that it is so, that pestilence befalls us or any similar event, it's evident that such is the good pleasure of God, and so consequently I conform myself to it. It's very, very similar we talked about in part three of our class, how we should be like Job, and always saying whether good, good times or bad, Blessed be the name of the Lord. That way you're going to keep your goodness within you no matter what happens. Now, look at it this way. You have to be able to join, to put together the will of God with that of his good pleasure. Those two need to come together, okay? God is not some tyrant. He's like messing with you, okay? Making you go through all kinds of stuff because he's just, you know, like some kind of crazy science experiment, okay? He's just joking. He's having fun with us, okay? He doesn't do that, all right? All that he wills for us is for our good, whether in sickness or in health. So don't lose heart. Especially as the world deals with difficulties to come. The world has no idea how to deal with difficulties. We do. So unite yourself perfectly to the goodness of God, and God will use you to bring goodness to others, most especially in the example of how you handle everything that comes your way in life. Okay, what's number four? The next teaching, next piece of advice on how you can keep your grace in this world can be called Soften Your Sorrows. Soften Your Sorrows. If you just got through seeing, all that we go through, including our sorrows, is for our own good. But this doesn't mean we should become totally undone, totally fall to pieces whenever we have to go through sorrows, okay? Yes, we have to grieve, of course we do. We can still soften our sorrows. So St. Francis de Sales, he once had to write to his very special spiritual daughter, St. Jane de Chantal. Remember, we talked about her. Her husband was accidentally killed by a friend while out on a hunting expedition. He got shot by one of his friends, okay? And so St. Francis had to write to St. Jane, and he told her, You asked me how I wish that you should act on an interview with the gentleman who killed your husband. I replied, it's not necessary you should seek an occasion for it, but if such an occasion does present itself, I wish you to keep your heart calm, gracious, compassionate. I know that doubtless your heart will be stirred and agitated and that your blood will boil, but what matters that? Our dear Savior felt this at the sight of dead Lazarus, and we have the vision of his passion. Yes, but what does Scripture say? On both occasions he lifted up his eyes to heaven, God makes us see in these emotions we're made of flesh and blood as well as spirit. So yeah, we're human. We have our emotions. Oftentimes in life, sorrows can get the best of us. We need to be able to follow the lead of our Lord Jesus, especially during his passion, and take courage and go forth in all virtue. You see, understand something. God may not dry all of your tears, because sometimes those tears have to flow. Some, so very often they have to be shed. But as St. Francis told St. Jane, go forward in holiness and virtue, abiding in peace. Keep yourself on your feet and keep yourself on the side of heaven. Don't give up on heaven. See, God has held you with his goodness during your affliction. So no question, for us too. God will hold you close to himself in his goodness, whatever hardship you have to face, okay? Now, he does refer though, to St. Gregory the Great, who once said to a bishop who was suffering great sorrows, My God, how can it be that our hearts, which are already in heaven, are agitated by accidents of the earth? It's very well said. See, think about it this way. 
Because our hearts are doing it right. They're already in heaven. Doesn't your heart belong to Jesus? Well, last time I checked, Jesus is in heaven, isn't he? So your heart should be there too, okay? So why, why are you getting all upset and losing your heart of things of the earth if your heart is already in heaven? But here's the thing that St. Francis pulls out from St. Gregory's teaching. The mere sight of our dear crucified Jesus can soften in a moment all of our sorrows. Because our sorrows are only flowers in comparison with the thorns he had to endure. As Francis tells us, always keep in mind the meeting point that is eternity. In other words, the reward which we need to always have in view is that. He said, how can anything affect you which is terminated by time? Yeah, all things are going to come to an end. All things are going to pass, except for the love of God that he has for you. Prepare for that meeting point in eternity when it's all said and done. Part of this softening of our sorrows, though, it also is to continue to unite yourself more and more with our Savior. So Francis tells us, plunge your heart into that abyss of charity, which is his. And let us say always, with all of our heart, let me die and let Jesus live. Let me die, let Jesus live. Our death will be happy if it be in this life that we have that kind of attitude. And as he goes on to say, you know, quoting St. Paul, I live, says the apostle, then he corrects himself immediately, not, not I, but Christ lives in me. So may you too be blessed with the blessing that divine goodness has prepared for you and for your heart. And always be courageous. God is so good to you, so live joyfully before him. As Francis de Sales tells us, years go on and eternity approaches. May we so employ these years in divine love that we may be able to enjoy eternity in its glory. But to put that very practically, don't waste any time. Don't waste your time. Our final piece of advice for our class is simply this, one of his great, pieces of his, one of his great teachings of all time. Be content. Be content, man. Okay? So very often, we're far from being content. Be content. So here's how he approaches this. St. Francis de Sales once taught, what is humility? Is it, is it the knowledge of our misery and our poverty? Yes, St. Saint, Saint Bernard. But that is human humility. What then is Christian humility? It's the love of this poverty and lowliness in consideration of that of our Lord. Know that you are a creature, poor and little, but love to be such. Glory in being nothing. Be well content in your place since your misery becomes the object of God's goodness, as we discussed. And on you, on you, he exercises his great mercy. It's one of the most practical things Francis de Sales ever said concerns this piece of advice. We ourselves are nothing more than poor people, okay? The most miserable among us is the, in the best condition to attract the mercy of God, who looks most willingly on the most pitiable of his creatures. So we simply have to be content with the fact we're nothing more than poor people. But that sort of, ability, that sort of humility brings great grace. And in that great grace, we become very, very rich with a richness that lasts. That's the type of richness we want to have, okay? So that's why Francis says, let us humble ourselves, I beseech you. Let us preach nothing but our wounds. Now, before I continue that quote, some of us are very good at preaching nothing but our wounds, to the point of saying, oh man, what's, what's wrong with you now, okay? All right. <laughs> but the thing you have to keep in mind though is, is this, how should we preach nothing but our wounds? Well, he, he lets us know. Remember how we to preach them joyfully. Oh, I don't quite do that. Okay, preach them joyfully. Consoling yourself at being altogether empty, that God will satisfy you in his kingdom. So, being content in this manner is easy, we can simply see it's just the path to the kingdom of God for going to be home with him. But, something else we have to be content with. So, quoting him once again. Be sweet and kind to everyone, except to those who would rob you of your glory, which is your misery. In other words, don't let anybody take your misery from you. That's what you're going to be presenting to our Lord, okay? It's terribly interesting that our glory is in our miseries. Be content with that, all right? But he continues. 
You must take good care of your misery, your loneliness, for God takes care of it as he did of that of the Holy Virgin Mary. Man sees that those things that appear, but the Lord sees the heart. And if he sees the lowliness of our hearts, he will give us great graces. And one of those graces we, were, we can receive, we're content with everything. We can see the lowliness of our hearts is joy. Like he calls it cheerfulness. So, to quote Francis again, Keep yourself, therefore, cheerfully humble before God. But keep yourself equally cheerful and humble before the world. See, be very content. If the world makes no account of you, if it values you, cheerfully ridicule it and laugh at its judgments at your misery, which it accepts. But if it does not value you, comfort yourself cheerfully on the ground. At least in this instance, the world follows the truth. See, the world thinks of you as nothing. They got it right, man. That's right, I am nothing without God. Okay? So don't, don't, that's why you don't, you don't worry about what the world has to say. What's God trying to tell you? Yeah, I'm nothing. But in God, we are everything, man. Everything. So remember then, that when we're lowly is when God shines through us with the greatest of intensity, okay? But this calls for us, of course, obviously to be truly humble. So St. Francis tells us to understand what is meant by the spirit of humility. It's necessary to know that just as there's a difference between pride, the habit of pride, and the spirit of pride, there's also a difference between humility, the habit of humility, and the spirit of humility. So, if you carry out an act of pride, there's pride. If you carry out such acts on every occasion, wherever you go, that's the habit of pride. If you take pleasure in those acts and are on the lookout for them, that's the spirit of pride. It's hard to break that spirit of pride, okay? But in the same way, if you do an act of humility, there's humility. If you do an act of humility on all occasions, wherever you go, there's the habit of humility. If you take great pleasure, as you should, in humiliation, on the lookout for abjection, as St. Francis of Sales calls it, there's the spirit of humility, which, by the way, nobody can take from you. People, people will, will be blessed powerfully through your spirit of humility. So in order for us to have such a spirit of humility and be truly content in all that we go through, we cannot be satisfied with just an occasional act of humility, but be humble and take pleasure in humility in all that we do. That way, just as it was with the Blessed Virgin Mary, we're not going to remain lowly. God will raise us, and we too will be richly blessed. So we'll use Mary as an example of how this works. She got it down perfectly. But how to keep such strong humility and thus a strong sense of contentment? How do we do this? Well, Francis de Sales tells us, it's good practice of humility never to look upon the actions of our neighbor except to remark the virtues that are in them, but never their imperfections. For so long as we're not caught, excuse me, as long as we're not in charge of others, let's never turn our eyes and still less our attention to their imperfections. Oh man, it's hard. So we're up and we're ripping our neighbor, man, the stuff that they do. And so if I see there's, well, maybe just like an imperfection, it's not really bad and so forth. And he gives us even more of the quote here. He says, we must always put the best judgment we can upon what we see our neighbor do. In doubtful matters, we ought to persuade ourselves that what we noticed is not bad. It's our own imperfections that cause such a thought to arise in our minds. And in cases in which we see, we see another do something clearly wrong, we ought to have compassion for our neighbor and humble ourselves for these defects as if they were our own, begging God for the other's amendment, the same heart we would for our own if we were subject to the same defects. That's an incredible amount of heroic charity. To love our neighbor like that is incredible. How are you going to pull that off? Well, the thing is, is this. You just have this last four classes we've been given to here, the great example of Francis de Sales, one of the great saints of all time, to give us the advice that we need to not just keep our peace, our contentment, our focus, despite the craziness of the world, but how to be the best of saints you can be yourself. Nothing is impossible with God. It all begins with just trying to do the best you can to reflect the Lord in everybody, including your neighbor. So here there's one final quote from St. Francis de Sales. We ought to have great courage 
and most firm confidence in God and in his assistance. If we do not fail to respond to his grace, he will accomplish in us the good work of our salvation. Praise God. We'll see you guys later. God bless now.